I charge you and challenge you to open your hearts, minds, and ears to receive a message of hope from today's gospel reading from the book of St. John, chapter 21. This is the final chapter in this extraordinary book. I love reading from this book of John because it was written as, John was written as being the disciple that Jesus be loved, the beloved disciple. John takes on a radically different approach to the story of Jesus than the other gospels do. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all so much alike in the way that they tell the story that they are called the synoptic gospels, which comes from the Greek word meaning viewing together. John, on the other hand, is sometimes called the spiritual gospel because it does more than just report the events of Jesus' life. It uniquely explains what those events reveal about Jesus. The writer carefully chooses only the incidents that help answer the question, who is Jesus? The reason lies in the purpose stated near the conclusion of John in the 20th chapter, verse 31, which reads, these words are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah of God, the Son of God. The book of John recounts only seven miracles in which he referred to as the signs that prove the divinity of Jesus. The Gospel of St. John also preserves long conversations between Jesus and others about who he is and why God sent him. The writer admits in chapter 21, verse 25, that he has left out much of the miracles Jesus did. It reads, if all were set down, the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Somebody needs to say amen. So in today's reading, we find Jesus showing up, surprising his followers in his third resurrection appearance. Jesus comes upon the disciples again, or at least to the seven who are mentioned in the first two scriptures. Peter says he stays in character here as the doubting one who continues to humble and stumble around before realizing what he's actually called to do. I wonder if Peter was simply not truly ready, willing or able to reach out to such a call before this. His first act in response to the first two resurrection appearances after Jesus finally satisfies his strong doubt consists of Peter convincing the others to go fishing. His actions follow a typical human pattern, an intense spiritual experience that soon fades, and one returns to doing the same things that he or she has always done. Jesus' powerful ministry of discipleship concludes the very same way that it began, with Jesus saying to the men that hunger and thirst and search for righteous knowledge and guidance, Jesus causes a subversive ripple effect when Jesus said, come, follow me. But this time, Peter's return to his previous life is radically transformed. His fishing expedition becomes a new experience of abundance by mirroring the other miracles of Jesus, like the 100 gallons of uh, wine at the wedding celebration in, in Cana, or the 12 baskets of food that was left over after the feeding of the 5,000 in Capernaum. So here and now, Jesus was standing by the shores of the Sea of Tiberias. The nets that had been empty when used under the disciples' own power, and now they have filled almost to bursting with a word from their risen Christ, who appeared to them suddenly and then later prepared them a meal. This is the last breakfast, if you will. Again, transforms a moment of hopeless deprivation and insufficiency into an unlimited feast with unexpected blessings of God's abundance made available for all. After the meal, Jesus' at Jesus's attention turns to Peter, whose threefold denial of Je in, at Jesus' trial and rapid return to his old occupation are graciously redeemed and redirected in positive conversations with his Savior. The terminology of this conversation, with its repeated question asking, Peter, 
do you love me? And the assertions, yes, Jesus, you know I love you. Um, when he said, Jesus, I know I love you for the third time, it required some study from me. So I started with the words used for love. Notice the intentional use of Jesus asking Peter the same question three times. The same amount of times that Jesus predicted that Peter would soon deny him. Hmm. For me, these actions alone have historically instilled the number three as a trifecta, a very special mystical number. That's Trinity love. It's long been noted and often noted in misleading ways that the Greek language has three words for love. That's eros, philos, and agape. We English speakers must make do with just one name, but these three Greek words are often considered to be in something of a ranked order. Eros is placed at the bottom as a self-centered, selfish love that cares little for the well-being of its object. Philos is described as slightly better than Eros, but still second rate, merely consisting of the love between friends, which can be deep, meaningful, and other-directed but which cannot compare with agape. Agape stands in this ordering as the highest form of love, like God's love for the world, a pure, selfless, unconditional love that can only have a divine source. In this understanding, we might expect Christ to lead Peter from a lower form of love, either eros or philos to the highest form, agape, but this is not. In fact, what happens here, in the Greek translation, Jesus' first two questions are agape, and Peter answers with a less passionate philos. However, in his third question to Peter, Jesus changes the terminology, asking Peter finally, Peter, do you love me in a philos way? And Peter answers apparently correctly, Yes, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you in a philos way. Here and everywhere in John, the understanding of agape and philos does not always fit the expected scheme. The analysis, this analysis suggests that the long-standing interpretation is misguided, and it has implications for our own understandings and perceptions of how God calls us to love. In addition, at the end of Jesus' ministry, when John explains why some of the authorities believed in Jesus but did not confess him publicly, it says, for they agape loved human glory rather than the glory that comes from God. This agape love is the kind of love that is very deeply emotional and heartfelt. It involves one to the core of their being, and it is entirely misdirected as the right love for the wrong things. Agape love can be a love that comes from God and leads to life. It can also become desperately distorted, directed towards things that turn us away from God. When Jesus himself clarifies the highest form of agape love for Peter, he does so in terms of philos love, No one has has greater love than agape love to lay down one's life for one's friends. In fact, Jesus goes on to define his relationship with his disciples in terms of friendship. I do not call you servants any longer, but I have called you friends. Jesus calls Peter not just to love others, but to love them to the end. Peter's restoration to renewed relationship is also a restoration to a new kind of leadership. Peter is a fisherman no more. He is now called to to feed Christ's sheep. Three times, may I add. And because of that feeding, eventually he too will die. Verse 18 reads, Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, someone 
else will fashion your belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. Personally, reading this, I got excited about the fashion possibilities that people may have had the option of wearing pants back in those days. But seriously though, after Jesus was indicating to Peter the kind of death by which he would honor and glorify God, in verse 19 when Christ says to him, follow me, which is exactly the same words that Jesus said when he first saw and met his disciple friends working hard on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. In our second reading tonight, which comes from the revelation of St. John, who had now become an exiled Christian prophet, John had a series of fantastic futuristic visions. Some of them are beautiful, such as those depicting heaven. Other visions he had are horrible scenarios in which they describe blood-soaked battlefields and world-shattering destruction. Yet, all reassuringly, the writings confirm that John's faith in God is well-founded. John writes that Christian persecution will end and the church will emerge victorious. God's plans for the future are revealed in these passages. Though they often heavily veiled with strange and perplexing symbolism in a genre of literature that was born out of necessity and oppression. John wrote to encourage all Christians who were suffering intense and sometimes deadly persecution, probably in the, in the late reign of the Roman emperor Domitian, who was in power at about AD 95. Domitian insisted that his subjects addressed him as their Lord God, and they, would have, and they would have burned sacrifices in worshiping him, punishing all those who refused. But John's prophetic source for these writings is Jesus. Jesus sent an angel to assist John with the script, the same process that the Old Testament prophet and apocalyptic writer Daniel did. The elder Daniel also required an angel's guidance and counsel throughout a series of mysterious visions that he was given by God. Revelation chapter 5, verse 13 reads, Then I heard every creature in heaven and earth and under the earth and in the sea and at this, and at this in them singing to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might and forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. See here, even the worships elder Jesus. I mean, even the elders worship Jesus. And even though this is the book of Revelation from which I tend to avoid except for the good parts about heaven, most of the symbolism here is explanatory as it is talking about a kingdom of priests which the Lamb of God being adorned in a similar terms of adoration that we render to God. But my brief research describes here that these four seals described here are the four seals of destruct destruction. Now, I won't go off on a tangent about the existing evil that's always lurking around God's people, but I will say that this part of the scripture definitely sounds like a form of hate which is the direct opposite of love. The kind of Christian love, whether it's called philos or agape, involves an inherent expectation of doing. Love is as love does. This is love as courage, love as risk, as not wavering, regardless of what we are called to do. Christ calls Peter and us as individuals and as communities of faith to follow Jesus even where we would not otherwise go, even where we, we may not want to go. The desperate times in which we live in are no time for doubt, no time for ret retraining, returning to what we are used to and the way that things used to be. 
These times more than ever are times that call for the best of the love of God. We need to learn how to agape or phylos love for all of our friends, neighbors, and enemies, all the ones that we can muster. These times cry out for the love of God, which puts our faith into actions that live life by example as Jesus did. Just as Jesus has resurrected my life, my love for Jesus took away my anger with God. So I suggest you find your balance and ride that tidal wave and a spiritual ripple effect that is Jesus. It has worked out well for me, and now I'm, living, I'm a living example of God's agape love. Now I'm living my best life in service to God since I decided to follow Jesus. And God will bring to life within us for the sake of others. So I welcome you to find your balance. I recommend that you find your Jesus for yourself, to follow him. But until then, I want to invite you to follow me. May it be so.